Hello, this is Reverend Deborah Gilbreth coming to you live on Facebook this Sunday morning, June the 17th, 2018. Excuse me. This morning we're going to have a good sermon on God's provision, His heavenly provision. But first let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you now, and we thank you so much for this time that we get to come and listen to your word and believe in your word and understand your word better, Lord. In your word there is power, Lord. Your word is true, and we thank you for giving it to us, Lord. Thank you for sending your Son here to earth to save us, Lord, your Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for bringing him into our hearts in a salvation relationship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing Amazing Grace this morning. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found twas blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers, tro toils, and snares. I have already come to His grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home that'll be enough of that okay today we are going to talk about the heavenly provision of god let me just grab my notes ah there we go Excuse me. <laughs> uh, now I'm ready. Jesus came to do many things. Jesus came to bring the Heavenly Father to us in a salvation relationship. Because our relationship with God had been broken in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve first sinned. Adam and Eve sinned because they were influenced by Satan. It was not specifically Eve's fault that they sinned. It was not specifically Adam's fault that they sinned. Satan is the one to blame. They were deceived. They had never had an opportunity to be deceived before. But we are made in God's image. So we do have to make choices. We are, each one of us are a free moral each one of us is a free moral agent so we are responsible for the choices that we make we made so many bad choices as humanity back in the day before jesus came that god and jesus had to get together and come up with a plan where we could be saved the reason this was necessary is because we cannot be in the presence of God with our sin. God is holy and pure and perfect and perfectly just. And if he accepts sin in his presence, he cannot continue to be holy and 
perfectly pure and perfectly just because uh, then he would be have some sin in his presence too so it's necessary for us to have salvation so God sent his son Jesus Jesus willingly came here to take on all of our sins in this world and to have them nailed to the cross when he was crucified on the cross and uh, this eliminated our debt of sin he paid our debt of sin and covered us and so uh, then we know that on the third day that he did die and that on the third day he rose again from the dead God raised him by the power of the Holy Spirit of God and he rose again and came forth and ministered to his disciples for a time and eventually ascended into heaven and sat down on the right hand of God the Father Almighty in heaven where he came from in the first place. Now when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and uh, believe that he died for us uh, to uh, save us from our sins and that he was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day. When we accept him as Lord and Savior over our life and believe in the gospel, we are saved from the penalty of going to hell for our sins uh, because of being separated from God. It's not so much a punishment to be punitive. It's a punishment because we cannot be in the presence of God with sin. I must bring this point home to you. God cannot be in the presence of sin and be holy at the same time. So uh, this creates a need for us to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior over our lives in a salvation relationship. Once we do that, we have a ticket to heaven. Yes, we do. But that is not the end of the story. We are doing this. Hopefully, we're not just doing it to get out of going to hell. Uh, if you think about the pain and the trauma that Jesus Christ went through to save us, if you'll look back here behind us, you'll see a cross that is made of nails and uh uh, those are big long nails and I keep that cross up there that cross says amazing grace on it and I keep that cross up there it reminds me every time I look at it uh, of the sacrifice that Jesus made to save me to save my soul to get forgive my sins that he took those nails into his hands into his feet on the cross and was crucified there uh, and he took on all all my sin he took on all my past sins all my present sins and all my future sins he's got my sin is covered all I have to do is ask Jesus to forgive my sin in Jesus name and my sins are covered your sins are covered too under the same conditions if you will ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins uh, in Jesus name tell him you're sorry you did the sin and you ask for his forgiveness you are forgiven your sin is covered though your sins be as scarlet they will be whiter than snow uh, something like that and I say I don't have a chance to look that up right now while we're on the internet but that is one of my favorite uh, scriptures he's going to cover our sins like a cloud he will cover our sins and forget our sins so uh, I have a lot of scriptures uh, around in various places uh, referencing that because I mean like any other human being I have had a sin problem in my past life and I had to go before the Lord and tell him I'm so sorry that I have failed uh, and made these mistakes and I need your forgiveness please forgive me for my sins and help me to have a new life and live a new way and Christ extends his grace and love for us he's full of grace that's why we sang the song amazing grace at the start of 
uh, this session because his grace is amazing. He will forgive any sin. You may think, well, I've done something that is so bad that I just can't come before Christ and ask him to forgive me. Believe me, you can do it. You can ask Christ to forgive you. Just tell him you're sorry that you did that. You wish you would, didn't do it and you would like to have him to forgive your sins in Jesus' name and he will do it. You will be forgiven, and uh, when anyone comes to the Lord, uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he is a new creature in Christ. The old is forgotten, the old is passed away, and you are a brand new creature in Jesus Christ. You don't have to hang your head down with guilt. You don't have to be ashamed. Satan will come back around and try to accuse us of our sins and make us feel guilty, guilt, shame, and remorse. He can tie us up with guilt, shame, and remorse where we can't think how to pray right. We can't think how to uh, navigate as a child of God. As a child of God, we can ordain things through prayer. God will act on our prayers. That's what we're going to be talking about today in just a minute. God's provision. The truth is God will act on our prayers. If we say the heartfelt prayer the way the scripture says to say it, God is going to take action. Now, he may not just give you what you prayed for, but he is taking action to, to solve the problem and to meet the need. Oftentimes, it will give you exactly what you prayed for. Don't listen to people that say that uh, this is from previous times in the Bible. I've searched the Bible front to back several times. I've never found anything in the Bible that says God doesn't do this anymore. What I have found is a scripture that says he does not change. So if God does not change, then these scriptures are still true. Excuse me. So today we're going to talk about the, God's heavenly provision. And we're going to look at an example where Jesus feeds the 5,000 people. This is in the book of John. It's in chapter 6. It's right after, it's shortly after the... Uh, yeah, it's shortly after he healed the uh, lame man at the pool of Bethesda in chapter 5. Then Jesus gave a, a big discussion with the Jews because they were mad about him healing that man on the Sabbath. So, we're going to go ahead and read uh, this passage in John chapter 6 about... Jesus feeding the 5,000 people, the loaves and the fishes. Many of you are familiar with that story. Okay. Uh, John 6, 2. And a great multitude followed Jesus because they saw his miracles, which he did on those who were diseased. They were following him because they knew now that Jesus had the power to do miracles which came from his anointing with the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit had descended on him at his baptism in the Jordan when he was baptized by John the Baptist. And he was, he was God's divine son, and he was doing miracles. 6-3, John 6-3, And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was coming up soon. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a large amount of people coming to him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread so that these people can eat? And this he said to confirm their outlook on the situation because he himself knew what he was about to do. Parentheses, to test them for their practice their practice of faith in God. Jesus was going to give his disciples a test. He was teaching his disciples. He was actually training his disciples 
to take over his ministry and stewardship of his church after he uh, finished his mission and was crucified. They did not know that. They needed to be able to perform miracles of provision for people. They need to be able to perform miracles of healing. Any miracles that Jesus was doing, they needed to be able to do those. And he was trying to convince them that the power of the Holy Spirit, God, the Heavenly Father, uh, that they should learn to work with that power. Okay, so uh, Philip answered, a year's wages would not be enough for each of them to have a small amount. Of food. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here with five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now, in those days, you counted the men, the men were responsible for everybody else. Uh, in the society, in the economy, uh, in the justice system, uh, and as spiritual leaders of the family, the men were truly held fully accountable for every man, woman, and child in their family. Uh, and so that's who they sat down first. Uh, Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so about 5,000 men sat down. Now, if 5,000 men sat down, they had women and children with them, too. So this is a very large number of people that are sitting down and getting ready. They're hungry. They want to hear Jesus teach. They're faint from their travels, and he's got it in mind to feed them. So... Uh, the book of John, verse six, chapter 6, verse 11 says, And Jesus took the barley loaves from the boy, and he gave thanks to God for the food. He gave some, he gave some to his disciples, and the disciples gave some to those that were sitting down. Then the fishes were distributed in the same manner. When everyone was full, Jesus said, said to his disciples gather up the pieces that are left over so that nothing is lost a parenthesis don't waste god's resources god owns everything he can make everything but he doesn't want us to be wasteful being good stewards is something that god encourages us to do to make the most of what he gives us maximize our usage of the uh, gifts, talents, and resources that he gives us to use. John 6 verse 13 says, Therefore they gathered together all the leftover fragments of the five barley loaves and the two fishes that remained after everyone had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus had pointed out that Moses had uh, written of him. And this is before the New Testament was written. In the book of the Gospel of John, the New Testament has not been written. So when he's talking about the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament. And... Uh, he is telling us in plain language there that uh, the Old Testament is full of prophecy uh, that a Messiah will come to bring salvation and that he is that Messiah. He tells the woman at the well, uh, I am he. When she says when Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. He is the Messiah that is here to tell us and teach us all things. Jesus loves us. He has a deep compassion for us. And so his heart was uh, full of pity for these people that were climbing a mountain 
trying to, they were walking long distances. They followed him there from Bethesda where he healed the lame man. They were following him because they saw him heal a man that had always been lame uh, and tell him to take up his bed and walk. And the man got up and walked and they were amazed that Jesus could do that. So they wanted to see what could Jesus do for them. And they followed him from Bethesda over here to uh, outside. I think this was outside Jerusalem. It was by the Sea of Galilee. And uh, Jesus had sat down on a mountain there to, to teach them. And the people were just famished. They were faint and exhausted. And Jesus loves us. He cares how we feel. He knows how we feel and he cares how we feel. He longs to minister to us. He loves it when we can ask him, Jesus, please help me. Please give me some energy. Please help me get some water. Please help me get some food. Please bless this food that I'm going to, to eat. He likes for us to do that. So there are some lessons to be uh, apprehended from this uh, reading. That was John, the book of John, chapter 6, verse 2 through 14. 214, that's Valentine's Day. You can remember it that way. Verses 2 through 14. And uh, that's where we read about the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus is a big miracle, his first feeding miracle. He has another one later on in the Bible. So this is where we learn that Jesus is able to feed us physical food. Jesus is able to provide for our need for physical food. This is an amazing concept to people. As a matter of fact, the people that ate the miraculous, miraculously provided food were more impressed with being full, with having full stomachs than they were with uh, the meaning of Jesus' ability to, uh, uh, the meaning of Jesus' ability to provide this food in a miraculous way. They weren't asking questions about God or God's will or God's provision. They just were accepting it as if it came by magic. They would have accepted it just as happily if Jesus had been a magician like the ones when God told uh, Moses to tell his brother Aaron to throw down his rod and it turned into a snake and then all the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, threw down their rods and turned their rods into a snake as they were magicians they could do the same thing. So th these people, these people were not having a religious experience. They were hungry and they were fed and they appreciated that very much. If they had thought about it a little bit more, they might have realized that Jesus was trying to show them that he is God in the flesh. He is the very God is the very Son of God in the flesh. The Trinity has three people and uh, three persons. They're not people, they're deity. Uh, three persons in the Trinity, God the Father, the Creator, God the Son, and the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. Our uh, comfort, our guide who will teach us all truth. They were all together at creation. That's why it says, let us make man in our image. Uh, that's the Trinity, three persons in the Trinity. Jesus was trying to show these people. He was feeding all these loaves and fishes miraculously generated from five barley loaves and two fish that he is very God in the flesh, uh, the Son of God. The second point is, that Jesus would have liked for them to realize and he wants us to realize today is that Jesus Christ has complete sovereignty over all physical matter. 
don't ever believe that Jesus cannot do a physical miracle today. He doesn't just run around doing those all the time because God set the universe in motion. He set physical laws in motion to hold everything in place, ordained by God. He is all throughout the universe. Uh, he's present, but... Uh, he has set things up to work a certain way for us to use our ability as free moral agents to choose with our minds to make decisions and to reap the consequences of these decisions. We're not going to learn to be like God as his children made in his image unless we practice doing what he does, which is think creatively, act creatively, and reap the rewards of our actions. Okay, so the third thing that we can realize from this miracle of feeding 5,000 is Jesus has complete sovereignty over all the laws of nature. Um, you know, you can't get blood out of a turnip, you know, <laughs> they say. And uh, Jesus can. He can do anything. Uh, he can make the rain start. He can make the rain stop. He can make the sun shine. He can make the sun stand still in the sky like they do over in Judges with Gideon while he's fighting to give him a little more time by making the sun stand still in the sky. Jesus has complete sovereignty over all the laws of nature. That was God that did that in Judges. But Jesus can do anything that he sees his Father do. He tells us that in Scriptures. The fourth point I'd like to make is that Jesus is tenderhearted toward us. He's long-suffering toward us. His heart is filled with love and compassion for us, amazing grace and tender pity. We don't ever need to be afraid of Jesus. What we need to be afraid of is Satan. Satan loves to steal, to kill, and to destroy each one of us. He wants to separate us from the love and companionship and presence of our Heavenly Father. Jesus is our great shepherd. We are like safe sheep in his care. When we are praying to him and trying to live by his statutes, we are safe as his flock, his sheep. We are safe from Satan's ploys. Uh, but he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Usually the only way he can do it is by deceiving us in our mind. Uh, Jesus is tender-hearted towards us, and he wants to forgive us. He wants us right back in his flock. He doesn't want to lose one sheep. So ask him to forgive you. Don't be stubborn. Don't be ashamed. Don't be shy. Say, Lord, forgive me. I've made a mistake. Please forgive me. I ask it in Jesus' name. And name your mistake to him. He knows what it is anyway. He loves us no matter what we have done. It's just like if you have a child that is your biological child. That child will always be your child. They may leave your presence. They may break off their relationship with you socially. But they can never change the biological reality that they are bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. They came from you. So we are God's children, and that does not change because of what we have done, right or wrong. Uh, Jesus will forgive you if you will ask him. There may be some consequences to your actions that you have to bear, but uh, Jesus will alleviate a lot of those, usually. And he will be with you while you bear those consequences. He will be loving you, upholding you, caring for you giving you strength and ability to deal with what you need to deal with. Now, the fifth point that I would like to make on this is that sometimes we must feed people physically before we can feed them spiritually. If I want to go out and minister to the homeless and they've been cold all night and wet and they're hungry and starving, uh, 
you know, uh, maybe they smoke and they really need a cigarette. You know, I don't want to encourage anyone to smoke, but when they've been smoking, you know, I'm not going to take a ministry of cigarettes out there, but uh, the thing of it is, is I'm going to go out and first thing, if I just start talking to them when they're in that condition, they're not going to be able to receive my message very well. They're not going to be able to feel love in their heart. And so what we need to do, we need to get them warm. We need to get them dry. We need to get them some coffee, a donut, some, a little bit of food, a little bit of comfort measures, and uh, a little bit of discussion, talk. Uh, how are you? A little uh, recognition and affirmation to open them up. Uh, do some things to open them up to be ready to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we don't just run out there and start preaching while they're laying there in utter misery. So we, we need to minister to their physical needs because they their physical needs are significant and they are stopping them from being able to be open to hear and receive the gospel. So we need to use good judgment and be good stewards of the gospel. Anyone who preaches is a steward of the mystery of God. So you're a steward of a mystery. So uh, don't let it be a mystery to you that people uh, cannot listen to you when they are hungry. They cannot listen to you when they are wet. They cannot listen to you when they are cold or terribly overheated. You may need to take a care package out there to them with some wet wipes and sun visor, maybe some sunglasses, maybe some chapstick, a bottle of water, you know, something, a towel to dab their self off. So t minister to their physical needs sometime when you want to carry the gospel. The sixth point we're going to talk about <clears throat> is that Jesus is the Lord of abundance, and he can meet all of our needs. We don't have any needs that Jesus cannot meet. He's tender, he's loving, and he's caring. He cares about our heart's desires, too. If you start taking a journal, a little book, and start writing in it, your prayer request to God and then go back once every three months or something and look back over those prayer requests, what you're going to find is he answers a lot of our prayers and goes over and above what we ask for uh, to let us know how much he loves us and how much he cares for us. So, um, just test it out yourself. You don't even need to take my word for it. It works. If you use a prayer journal, you will find that he's meeting your needs in special ways to give you little blessings, too, to show you that he really cares for your wants, needs, and desires as much as for your big, dire needs, which he meets those, too. The seventh point I want to make today is that gratitude, praise, and thanksgiving are due to our Heavenly Father, and no one is exempt from this privilege and duty. Jesus himself stopped at what he was doing and gave thanks to his Heavenly Father for those five barley loaves and those two fish. And don't you know his disciples may have thought he was crazy when he was thanking God for five barley loaves and two fish when they had a multitude of people there to feed. He knew what he was going to do. He knew what his heavenly father was going to do. And he was grateful to his heavenly father. And there is power in gratitude. So don't forget that. There is power in praise. Remember that too. There's power in thanksgiving. We should always say grace before we eat. No matter where we are, don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Just go ahead and bless your food and ask God to use your body to his service. The eighth point I want to make 
is that we should always take inventory of what our Heavenly Father has provided for us and give thanks. If I'm feeling a lack of something, uh, or if I'm thinking I'm going to need something, the first thing I need to do is start thanking God for my clothing, for my shelter, for the food I've been eating, for my safety, for my family, for my friends, my vehicle, uh, whatever I have around me that he's already provided. Take inventory. Give God thanks for what he has already provided uh, for you. Take inventory, acknowledge it to him, and praise him for giving you that. And then ask him, you know, for the additional thing that you uh, need. But do take inventory and do give thanks. There's power in that. It has a, a multiplying power. You're not multiplying it, but God is saying, you're grateful for what I've already given you. I'm going to give you more. And the last point that I want to make here today on this talk, part of the talk, is that we are not to waste our Heavenly Father's resources just because He can make things and create things and bring something out of nothing does not mean that we're just supposed to be wasteful, mindlessly using things, not using any economy in our methods. Um, Jesus told them to take up all the excess fragments of loaves and fishes so that nothing would be wasted. That's what he wanted, nothing to be wasted. Let's not be wasteful. Let's be good stewards of God's resources. He's got, he's got an endless supply of resources to give to us. He has unlimited resources to give to us. But he does want us to be intelligent, wise steward of his resources, making the most out of what he has given us. Now, when we need something from God, I'm going to, to go over four scriptures that we can use, uh, that we can stand on as promises when we need to ask God for something. We have to go before our Father. We're going the, today is Father's Day. I want to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers here on the earth. Being a father is a very important job, and it means so much to all of us who have had fathers and everyone who has had a father figure in their life. You may not have had a father, or maybe you had a father that was hard to uh, receive love from for some reason. Uh, but there may have been a preacher or a coach or a neighbor in your life that served as a father figure or another relative that cared about you and kind of led the way and set the example. Uh, I just, uh, that's all I can say is thank God for fathers. I was blessed with an absolutely wonderful father. I loved him very much and he's in heaven now and I do miss him a lot. So I said happy Father's Day in heaven to all the fathers in heaven and happy Father's Day to my father in heaven. I saw that today on a, the Billy Graham website which I, I like to look at. Uh, not the official one, but one that's in honor of Billy Graham. Okay, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. We're going to look at verse 21 and 22. This is very important. This is one of the verses you can stand on when you need resources, you need something. Maybe you need healing. You need someone to be healed. You can stand on these uh, verses here. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 21 and 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say to this mountain, 
be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. It can't be more clear than that. He says, do not doubt. And it says, if you ask, believing. You need to kind of see it already happening in your mind's eye. I'm not sitting here talking about some sort of new age, visualize, you know, all that kind of thing. I'm saying, believe it when you pray it. Uh, Jesus asked, do you believe I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. And that's my answer to him. When I pray for someone to be healed, when I pray for someone to be fed, provision, provided shelter, uh, in my ministry work, I come across all kinds of needs, pitiful needs sometimes, of people, their hearts are broken, they're they're in uh, desperate circumstances and they need some immediate action and some immediate help and i do not have unlimited resources uh so i am not able to just run out there and say here i will fix this i have to go before my heavenly father and say lord i need to ask you please bring a healing to this person uh help dave's mother you know uh whoever I'm praying for, please provide this lady and her child with a, a home, a safe, secure, acceptable, good home for them. Or please uh, bring forth a job for uh, this man so he can provide for his family. I have to doubt not. Do not doubt. Uh, you have to ask as if you know God is going to bless you. He wants to bless you. He's standing by to bless you. So you can stand on Matthew chapter 21, verses 21 and 22. Try it. Don't listen to people that say it won't work. That's not for these times. Believe it. Uh, okay, Mark 11, 24. We're going to look at Mark chapter 11 verse 24 i've been doing this for years it works really well uh, god doesn't always do everything we say because god sees everything god knows everything god has a wonderful plan for our lives jeremiah uh, 29 11 says for i know the plans i have for you declares the lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So God is wanting to prosper me. I already know that. I've read that in the scripture. So Mark eleven twenty four. And twenty three. Mark twenty Mark eleven, chapter eleven, verses twenty three and twenty four. For verily I say to you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatever he says. Therefore I say unto you, what things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall. It can't be more. These are Jesus Christ's very words. These is, this is the word Jesus has spoken for me, for you, for us, uh, for us to, to claim, to read, and to say when we have needs. So let's try that and see. Write down in your prayer journal whenever you decide to try this and uh Write down what you asked for. You may want to write down what verse you stood on. I'm going to give you two more. John 15, chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, <clears throat> you shall ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. Now, there, that's conditional promise. 
you have to live in Jesus. Jesus has to live in your heart and you have to be living in him. Uh, talking to him each day, acknowledge him. Uh, hello, Lord, I'm here. I love you. I know I belong to you. I need your help today. Uh, that's abiding uh, in Jesus. And if his words abide in you, you should be reading and maybe writing out two or three scriptures per day. That's not too much. You can read more, uh, but you should write out a couple of them per day and ask God what he has for you. What nuggets of wisdom, what nuggets of truth does he have in his word for you today? And he will uh, enlighten your mind and show you some things. That's how I got this sermon, doing just that. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. Jesus is good for his word. We're going to trust him. Now, the last scripture that I'm going to give you today is going to be John chapter 15, verse 16. This is another promise you can stand on when you need God to help you. Maybe you need a husband. Maybe you need a, a wife, a mother for your children. Maybe you long to have a child and you want to be a parent. Uh, whatever you're going to ask him for. Uh, Verse 16 here in John chapter 15 says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Jesus is not just being like Santa Claus giving us gifts at Christmas. Jesus is trying to supply us and sustain us so that we can bring forth spiritual fruit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 tells what the fruits of the Spirit are. And uh, we're to develop that fruit in our lives, in our character. It's patience, love, gentleness, long-suffering, things like that. Uh, but we're to go out and help people, lead people to Christ, make disciples, help people uh, find uh, healing for their uh, problems. If, if we can lead them to the resources, we're to network and edify each other, pray for each other, love one another, forgive one another. But it's all for a greater purpose. It's so that we can bring these lost souls into Christ. He's the one that can lead them and teach them everything. He's the one that can heal everything that's wrong with them. So that's the ultimate goal. Now, uh, I've been a long-winded preacher today. I've talked a little longer than I had planned. But I just get excited when I, I got so excited when I found out Jesus would be my provision, that God would bring his heavenly provision into my life. Uh, now, I don't start asking for Cadillacs and a million dollars because I don't, I don't think this is going to bode well with God. I don't really need a Cadillac in my lifestyle where I am right now, and I don't need a million dollars, you know. 50 would be good, but a million, I don't need it. So let's just uh, be reasonable and sensible and humble when we're asking, but don't be too humble. Ask for what you need. Write it in your prayer journal, and then just check back. Leave your prayer journal alone for three months, six months, however long, and then come back and check in. Give God praise for every miracle that you see in there. And I promise you, you will see a lot of miracles. I made a list of 13 things that I needed help from God with uh, about three years ago. And I just looked at that list recently and he healed every situation beautifully. So give him a chance to work in your life where you can see what's going on. And that's my word uh, to you this week from the word of God. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and close out this sermon. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for everyone that heard your word today preached. 
here on this Facebook channel and all around the world in all the churches and on all the channels all over the world where people are preaching the word of God. Lord, your word heals. There is power in your word. There's power in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you for loving us and making us your children and sending your son to save us. Just lead us as we go out into this week to do your will, Father, and to be who you would have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until next week, y'all have a blessed week. Goodbye.